During the summer of 1963, the Earth had a ring around it. The same year that Martin Luther King Jr. marched on Washington, the United States launched half a billion whisker-thin copper wires into orbit in an attempt to install a ring around the Earth, calling it Project Westford, giving us a perfect example of the lengths the United States was willing to go to during the heights of the Cold War paranoia, as well as showing the military mentality at work in America's early space program. The Air Force and the Department of Defense envisioned the Westford Ring as the largest radio antenna in human history. Its goal was to protect the nation's long-range communications in the event of an attack from the increasingly hostile Soviet Union. But there were many problems with this idea, from the clutter it would cause just beyond our atmosphere, to the disruptions it caused for the scientific community, to the inherent technical issues with sending millions of needles into space. Today, we're breaking down Project Westford, and this is Learn Something New. During the late 1950s, long-range communications relied on undersea cables or over-the-horizon radio. The cables were robust, but far from invulnerable. It's also possible that America was worried about the Soviet nation tapping into their communications and listening to their private conversations, especially given that only a decade later, the US would do this to the Soviets as part of Operation Ivy Bells. And if the Soviets had attacked an undersea telephone or telegraph cable, America would only have been able to rely on radio broadcasts to communicate overseas. But the fidelity of the ionosphere, the layer of the atmosphere that makes most long-range radio broadcasts possible, is at the mercy of the sun, and it's routinely disrupted by solar storms. The US military had identified a problem, and a potential solution was to be born in 1958 at MIT's Lincoln Labs, a research station on Handsome Air Force Base northwest of Boston. Project Needles, as it was originally known, was laboratory director Walter E. Morrow's idea. He suggested that if Earth possessed a permanent radio reflector in the form of an orbiting ring of copper threads, America's long-range communications would be immune from solar disturbances and out of reach of nefarious Soviet plots. Each copper wire was about 1.8 centimeters in length. This was half the wavelength of the 8 gigahertz transmission signal beamed from Earth effectively turning each filament into what is known as a dipole antenna. The antennas would boost long-range radio broadcasts without depending on the fickle ionosphere. And while today it's hard to imagine a time where filling space with millions of tiny metal projectiles was considered a good idea, Project Westford was spawned before men had set foot in space, when generals were in charge of NASA's rockets and most satellites and spacecraft hadn't flown beyond the drafting table. Sputnik 1 had successfully launched just a year earlier, so it's fair to say that they didn't fully realized the ramifications of their actions. The agency operated under a big sky theory, which said that two randomly flying bodies were very unlikely to collide as the three-dimensional space is so large relative to the bodies. Surely, space is so big that the risks of anything crashing into a stray bit of space junk were minuscule compared to the large, looming threat of communism. Project Needles was renamed Westford for the neighboring town of Westford, Massachusetts. But this wasn't the first time someone suggested building a global radio reflector. In 1945, science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, known for writing his book 2001 A Space Odyssey, suggested that Germany's V-2 rocket arsenal could be repurposed to deploy an array of antennas into geostationary orbit around the Earth. Clarke's vision was so well known that today's communication satellites residing at these fixed points above the planet are said to reside in the Clarke orbit. But as Project Westford progressed through its development, radio astronomers raised alarms at the negative consequences this cloud of metal could have on their ability to survey the stars. After all, it's hard to monitor the radio waves coming in when the atmosphere is reflecting them back out. Concerns were also beginning to arise about the problem of space junk, but beneath these worries was an undercurrent of frustration that a space mission under the banner of national security 
was not subject to the same transparency as public efforts. The Space Science Board of the National Academy of Sciences convened a series of classified discussions to address astronomers' worries, and President Kennedy attempted a compromise in 1961. The White House ensured that Westford's needles would be placed in a low orbit, which would mean the wires would likely re-enter Earth's atmosphere within two years, and no further tests would be conducted until the results of the first were fully evaluated. This partially appeased the international astronomy community, but still, no one could guarantee precisely what would happen to the 20 kilograms of copper wire dispersed into orbit. But on October 21st, 1961, NASA launched the first batch of West Ford dipoles into space. One day later, this first payload had failed to deploy from the spacecraft, and its ultimate fate was never completely determined, leading a Soviet newspaper to print the headline, USA Dirty Space. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson was forced to make a statement before the UN declaring that the US would consult more closely with the international scientists before attempting another launch, but this did little to quell the anger. Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle went so far as to accuse the US of undertaking a military project under a facade of respectability, referring to Westford as an intellectual crime. But on May 9th, 1963, a second West Ford launch successfully dispersed its spindly cargo approximately 3,500 kilometers above the Earth, along an orbit that crossed the North and South Pole. Voice transmissions were successfully relayed between California and Massachusetts, and the technical aspects of the experiment were declared a success. As the dipole needles continued to disperse, the transmissions fell off considerably, although at that point the experiment had already proved that the strategy could work in principle. Scientific concern about the military nature of West Fort continued following this second launch. On May 24th of that year, the Harvard Crimson quoted British radio astronomer Sir Bernard Lavelle as saying, The damage lies not with this experiment alone, but with the attitude of mind which makes it possible without international agreement and safeguards. The United States' military operations in space was giving them a reputation of being reckless, especially following 1962's high-altitude nuclear test, Starfish Prime. This famously bad idea dispersed radiation across the globe, spawning tropical auroras and delivering a debilitating electromagnetic pulse to Hawaiian cities. The ultimate fate of the Westford Needles is also surrounded by a cloud of uncertainty. Because the copper wires were so light, project leaders assumed that they would re-enter the atmosphere within several years, pushed earthward by solar wind. Most of the needles from the failed 1961 and successful 1963 launch likely met this fate. Many now lie beneath the snow at the poles. But not all of the needles return to Earth. Thanks to a design flaw, it's possible that several hundred perhaps several thousand clusters of clumped needles still reside in orbit around the Earth. The copper needles were embedded in a naphthalene shell designed to evaporate quickly once it reached the vacuum of space, dispersing the needles in this thin cloud. But this design allowed metal-on-metal -metal contact, which, in a vacuum, can weld fragments into larger clumps. In 2001, the European Space Agency published a report that analyzed the fate of needle clusters from both Westford payloads. Unlike the lone needles, these chained and clumped and had the potential to remain in orbit for several decades. And NORAD space debris databases list several dozen still aloft from the 1963 mission. But the ESA report suggests that because the 1961 payload failed to disperse, Thousands more clusters could have been deployed, and several may be too small to track. Even so, it would eventually be seen that the project wasn't needed in the first place. Active communication satellites quickly made projects like Westford obsolete, and no more needles were launched after 1963. Telstar, the first modern communication satellite, was launched in 1962, beaming television signals across the Atlantic for two hours a day. In Earth's ever-expanding catalog of space junk, Westford's bits of copper make up only a fraction of the total debris that circles the Earth, but they surely have one of the strangest stories. The operation serves as yet another reminder that it was military might that brought forth the first space missions, for better or for worse. Thanks for watching. If you feel like you learned something, be sure to hit the like button because it really helps the channel grow and reach new audiences. Thanks again and I will see you in the next one.